Hi, good morning. I'm going to do something uh, a little different. Uh, I'm going to start today a series on the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, when the Wizard of Oz would come on TV, it was a really big deal in our house. We had to have our baths early and get in our pajamas. I particularly remember insisting on wearing my yellow feet pajamas uh, <laughs> because I, somehow I knew it linked me to the yellow brick road. Um, there would be special treats that evening, you know, usually involving something fabulous on a Ritz cracker uh, because it was a special occasion after all. Remember, we had, um, of course, back then, only a black and white TV, this Magnavox TV that was about the size of an Oldsmobile <laughs> with a little screen, a little curved screen. My brother and sister and I and my parents, we'd all get close so we could watch it. And it was really a special, special event. I think that The Wizard of Oz, Frank Baum's story of The Wizard of Oz, is one of the great American myths. And one of the definitions of a myth is something that never was and always has been. So the myth shows us something about our spiritual journey. Uh, it's, uh, uh, Joseph Campbell said that a myth is a mask for God. I really like that, that a myth is a mask for God. So the homework for this week is to watch the movie version of The Wizard of Oz, uh, because I think there's a lot of metaphysics in The Wizard of Oz. So like the Bible, we can look at it and say, OK, all of this is not about somebody or someplace else. All of this takes place in me. All of these characters in the story of Oz take place within me. Uh, Dorothy's journey is at some point my journey on the road through life. So we'll talk a little bit about Dorothy. Dorothy is at a point in her life where she knows uh, that there has to be something better. How many have ever been there? <laughs> yes, there has got to be something better for me. Emma Curtis Hopkins, one of our teachers, says this. She says, there is good for me, and I ought to have it. Now, that's not an arrogant statement, because if there is good for you, it means that God has created that good, and shouldn't you have the good that God has created for you? Yes, well, this is what little Dorothy knows. Dorothy's just a young kid, you know, she's maybe, maybe a teenager, just barely though. And, uh, and she lives, she is an orphan, she lives with an elderly aunt and uncle on a farm in Kansas. So it's Dorothy and the farm and the aunt and uncle and the farm hands and the pigs and the chickens and all that. There's a, a saying, an old Roman saying, it says, the fates lead him who will. Him who won't, they drag. Okay. So Dorothy, clearly, Dorothy has a destiny of something greater. Mm -hmm. And so this is the impulse within her soul that starts her on her quest. You know she, who she is. She's out on a farm. She's unfulfilled. She's not understood. She feels like nobody hears her. There's got to be something better. Now, interestingly enough, early on in the story, Dorothy has no understanding of the idea of cause and effect. You know, that Dorothy is pretty much in her own world, the only teenager to ever inhabit that place, yes. Um, and she sees, so in the story, there is a storm coming. So everyone on the farm is getting ready for this big storm. And Dorothy, again, being in her own world, she's just told to stay out of the way. Just stay out of the way. The adults are doing stuff. We've got busy work. We've got important work to do here. Now, she doesn't have her see herself as having anything to do with the conflict that is in her life right now. And so the conflict is this, that when she walks home, she and her little dog, Toto, they walk by the home of Miss Elvira Gulch. <laughs> yeah. And Toto's, Toto goes into her yard and chases her cat. Now, this is not a woman who's going to be deterred. She has gone to the sheriff, and either she has a letter from the sheriff saying, either you give me the dog so the dog will be destroyed, or we're going to take your farm. So they have to surrender the dog. And Dorothy, understandably, is devastated by this. She's just crushed by this. But you know, that little dog is smart. While Elvira Gulch is bicycling away with the dog in a basket, <laughs> Toto jumps out and runs home. 
And Dorothy realizes that the thing to do is she has to leave home. Right? So this is that impulse in the soul that says to us, there's something better out there. This could be better for you. You could have a different experience. You could have a, bif uh, a better, a happier, a more joyful, a more loving experience than you are currently having. Go out and seek it. And Dorothy begins the hero's journey. That's what Joseph Campbell calls it. That Dorothy knows on some level, there's something greater for me. I've got to go find it. Uh, now, in the science of mind teaching, we teach that what shows up in the outer world is always a reflection of the inner world. So there is a storm coming. And what that says to us is that there was already a storm brewing in little Dorothy. You know? it, that shows us where we have to grow our own consciousness. And as we all understand, even if we run away, as Dorothy does, the problem with that is you take you with you wherever you go. You know, as we look back at our life and we say, God, all those things that I've been through, what's the common denominator? Me! That's the answer. You know, for everything that showed up in your life, you've been there for every one of those things. So, you know, people like to do that geographic thing, not realizing that they take them with themselves wherever they go, because their consciousness always shows up. So Dorothy has this dream of better. In fact, she even sings about someplace over the rainbow. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Now, I think when she sings that song, what she's doing is she is actually setting a very powerful intention about what she wants to create in her life. All right? She's so committed to this idea of a place over the rainbow where troubles melt like lemon drops and all that great stuff. So she and Toto take off, and they meet uh, a fortune teller. And while he's telling her fortune, the storm that's coming gets worse, and she decides she really needs to go home. But when she gets home, everybody has already gone into the root cellar below ground, and they've locked the door, so she can't get in. So she and Toto, they go into the house, and a shutter breaks off, hits Dorothy, conks her on the head, knocks her out. So I think it's interesting that Dorothy has to go unconscious before she gets more conscious. You know, She has to go to sleep before she wakes up. And how many of us have done that again and again and again? That sometimes going unconscious, we have to get epically unconscious, hugely unconscious, before we start the process of waking up. Oh, I love that. I love that. So you know, Dorothy's problem, again, is not external. You know, she's trying to avoid her problem, and what happens is it actually grows into technicolor. Mm -hmm. It does, you know. So what, as we think about it, and I think, all right, what is it that really shakes up poor little Dorothy? Is what shakes her up is what she treasures most, in her case, her little dog, what she treasures most is threatened. See, up until that point, she can kind of limp along, but once what's really near and dear to her gets threatened, boy, that really gets her attention. Now I've got to get serious. I've got to do something. And that's like so many of us, that we can put something off. We can stop giving something our attention. We can avoid it. We can procrastinate until it gets really bad. And when it gets really bad, boy, we're just there to break out those affirmations and pray and read and study and do every little bit of spiritual mumbo jumbo we know how to do because now it's really important. The rubber's met the road. So Dorothy, I see, is on this journey of deep personal transformation, a journey that only she can take herself. Nobody can do it for her. Hmm? So she lands in Munchkin land, OK? Munchkin land. She's lost her way, and she wants to get home. And so I would say again, well, on our journey through life, we have all lost our way probably multiple times, right? We lose, sometimes you lose your way for a day or so. Sometimes we lose our way for longer periods of time. Sometimes we lose our way for years at a time. So she did, but she doesn't see her part in this. And it's funny because you know, I, I, I think back to that farmhand who just says, what's the problem? And she says, well, it's Mrs. Gulch's cat. And he says, well, walk another way. Don't go by her house. Problem solved. See, he's, it, it, it's, it's a totally male way of thinking, right? 
It is. Well, then don't do that, and you won't have the problem. There, we never need to discuss it again. The process is over. Never bring it up. The problem is solved, right? It's such a male way, right? But Dorothy wants to process this. You know, she wants to talk about it, and, and she wants to keep doing what she's doing, looking for a different result. You know, but what she does is she just keeps contributing to the same problem over and over again. Why doesn't she choose a different way? It's magical thinking, right? That she has to evolve. I, um, I would hold that every one of us has had a cyclone or two in our life. Now, I think probably the lesson of the cyclone is that Dorothy has within her the resources she needs to meet this situation. Now, she doesn't realize it yet, but she really does have everything within her that she needs to go through this, this challenging situation. And that's what we teach in the science of mind, that we have within us right now all of the spiritual resources we need to meet whatever it is that's going on in our life, whatever it is that's confronting us right now. Because the outer upset calls us to do a level of spiritual work that we're now ready to do. It's not a coincidence that what's before us is before us right now. Because, because God within us is greater than any particular challenge that we go through on any given day in the course of our life. So Dorothy, like all of us, is destined to wake up. We can put it off for a while, but you know, at some point, you've got to pay the piper and we're going to wake up. So in the hero's journey, as Joseph Campbell describes it, is there is a call to adventure, and then there is a process of initiation, and then there is the return. And this is exactly what Dorothy does, like we have all done so many times in our life. You know, she doesn't come back the same person. And when we go through something, when we have a big challenge, or as I like to think of them as an AFGO, A-F-G-O, another fine growth opportunity, when we have one of those, we're supposed to be changed by it. We're not supposed to come back the same thing. And see, and so often people go into situations like that and they say, oh, if I can just get it to be like it was before, if I can just go back to the old normal. The old normal isn't coming around again. This is the new normal. Right? So like us, she does not come back the same person. She's changed. Hmm? So it's no longer, I don't fit, which is what Dorothy starts out with. It evolves, it transmutes into, I belong. And see, everyone belongs. Everyone, everyone belongs. No matter what we've heard, no matter what we've told ourselves, no matter what somebody else has said to us, we all belong. And so, you know, it's funny that, to me that Dorothy forgets um, where she came from. And what I mean by that is that Dorothy forgets her true nature. And this is what gets, why, where we all get in trouble. When we forget that we are connected with God, that God dwells within us, that all things are possible with God. We think it's just us, poor little old me out here, rowing the boat by myself. You know, that's when we really get in trouble. You know, we forget our oneness with God. Spiritual truth is that every single one of us, we are the sons and daughters of the Most High. And we could not be separate from God. We could believe we're separate from God, but in spiritual truth, we cannot be separate. And in addition to that, we all have the spiritual resources within us right now. And yes, there are cyclones in life. It would be fantasy to tell yourself that because you're on a spiritual path, there will never be another cyclone in your life. I have not found that to be true. You know? But the difference is, the distinction is now, now on the spiritual path, we can define how we experience the cyclone by the things that we bring to the table. Do we bring a good consciousness to the table? Do we bring a loving heart? Do we bring a forgiving presence? Do we do our spiritual practice? Because all of the spiritual work defines how we go through the cyclone in our life. Of course, I love the good witch, you know? And um, the good witch tells Dorothy at the end of the story, you always had the power to go back to Kansas. And the scarecrow says, well, why didn't you tell her? And the good witch says, well, because she wouldn't have believed me. She had to learn something for herself. Like all of us, people can tell us about how it is, or tell us what to avoid, or tell us what not to do or what to do. 
but so often we have to experience it for ourselves. You know, we have to walk our own spiritual journey. We have to do our own inner work. So I'm going to keep talking about The Wizard of Oz for the next few weeks, and I hope that you will join me on the journey, and your part is to watch the movie this week. It's an easy download. You can do this. I have perfect faith in you. Um, because, you know, like Dorothy, we will all have times in our life where we are in unfamiliar territory. Mm -hmm. But I know that we have what it takes to move through that unfamiliar territory. You know, the myth of the Wizard of Oz is... It all points to our deepest spiritual potential, I believe. You know? Uh, that it will, in pursuing this, I believe that what this leads us to is a greater experience of delight, a uh, greater experience of illumination, uh, even an experience of rapture. So come back for the next few weeks, and we're going to talk about the story and see how it applies to our lives. I promise you it does. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment to remember that right here where we are right now, the fullness and the allness of God, God's infinite loving spirit is right here. We are surrounded by it. We are filled with it. In fact, I know that this is the most true real thing about us, God's love within us. And so as we join together in thought and consciousness today, I just speak this word for each and every one of us that we are suited up for the journey that we are moving forward to a greater good in our life, whether that be a greater good in our health or our finances or our relationships or our creative expression. But there is, in fact, a greater good for each and every one of us. And yes, absolutely, we ought to have it. So I claim that we move forward with hearts and minds wide open and we receive the wisdom from this story, reminding ourselves all along the journey that everything we need is already within us. So we include in our prayer today our family members, our friends and loved ones. We say right where they are, God is. Surrounding them, filling them, uplifting them. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world around us. So where there is so much fear and doubt and confusion, we say God's perfect activity is unfolding right there beyond all appearances. That there is right action, there is peace, there is healing, there is love, there is abundant supply for all people. We claim that this is the truth, and so with a full heart, we bless our church and all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, knowing that we are all connected on the unseen side of life. And so for this and so much more, we say thank you, God, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.